Have you ever heard of someone being called a typhoid Mary? We use the term for someone who spreads destruction wherever they go. But have you ever thought, where did that phrase come from? Was there ever a real typhoid Mary? Well, it turns out she was real. Her name was Mary Mallon. And Mary Mallon might never be remembered today, except for a very unusual immunity that she had. Mary Mallon was born in County Tyrone, one of the poorest areas of Northern Ireland in 1869. It is suspected that she had typhoid fever as a girl, but it may have been so mild it was mistaken for the flu. She came to the US when she was only 14 or 15, probably on an immigrant ship like this, packed with other immigrants. She was fortunate in having connections in New York. She lived with an aunt and uncle there until she went out to work on her own as a servant. There is nothing unusual in any of this. It made Mary one of millions of Irish who came to the US in the 19th century. That's an era when it's estimated 50% of the country's population left their homeland to try and make a better life elsewhere. Like many Irish girls, Mary Mallon came alone and she quickly found work as a domestic servant. But unlike most people, Mallon, we now know, was carrying a deadly disease. She was carrying typhoid fever. You don't hear much about typhoid fever, thank goodness. So let's take a look at exactly what it is. Typhoid fever is carried by a bacteria, Salmonella typhi. Most of the time it's passed from one person to the next through food or water that's been contaminated. You cannot get it through coughing or breathing. You have to ingest it to get sick. If you do get sick from it though, symptoms are pretty unpleasant. Fatigue, nausea, headache, abdominal pains, ranging all the way up to fever and some terrible gastrointestinal uh, distress. Without treatment, you might develop delirium, you might develop hallucinations and intestinal bleeding. Untreated, typhoid can kill one in five people. It's terrible. There was no cure, antibiotics did not exist, and a vaccine was not yet available. You can see why people were terrified of it. By 1900, typhoid had begun to decline, mostly because of public health improvements, better sanitation, better hygiene, all reinforced the idea, which they knew, that you can prevent outbreaks with better sanitation and clean drinking water. Still, it took years to understand exactly how typhoid fever could spread. The cause of typhoid wasn't even confirmed until 1880. The first vaccine wasn't widely available until 1914, and that is well after Mary Mallon had begun to work as a cook. So let's go back to Mallon. She enters history around 1900, which seems to be when one of her employers discovered she had a real flair for cooking. So they put her to work as a cook, one of the best paying domestic service jobs. Mary Mallon actually worked for eight families between 1900 and 1907. And wherever she went, typhoid fever appeared. This was unusual because Mallon was working for some of the richest families in the city. They were not exactly the families who tended to get typhoid. Altogether, in Mary Mallon's jobs between 1900 and 1907, 22 people fell ill and one of them died. Now there's no sign that Mary Mallon recognized she was in any way connected to the outbreaks. So she kept moving from job to job and it took a long time before someone connected the dots. That happened in 1906, because in 1906, a wealthy banker named Charles Henry Warren and his family decided to rent a house for the summer in Oyster Bay, Long Island. They brought along some servants and they hired Mary Mallon to be their cook. Oyster Bay was a popular vacation spot for the rich and influential. It had boating, it had beautiful vistas, grand homes. Charles Henry Warren and his family rented a house from George Thompson. And that August, one of their daughters fell ill. It was, of course, typhoid. Pretty soon Warren's wife got it too, and then another daughter, a gardener, two maids, all sick with typhoid. The Warrens quickly left for home to recover, but they left behind a big problem for the owner of the house, George Thompson. Who is going to rent a vacation house in a place where an entire family could fall mysteriously ill? Thompson had to find out exactly what had happened before he could rent this house again. 
He hired investigators to look into it. They couldn't figure it out. So he went to the New York City Department of Health and hired this guy. This is George Soper, a sanitary engineer. He specialized in typhoid outbreaks. At first, Soper thought maybe it was some freshwater clams the family had eaten. But not everybody in the household who got typhoid had eaten them. Through a process of elimination, Soper honed in on Malin as a possible source for the disease. Malin, by this point, she was working as a cook in another home on Park Avenue, probably a kitchen that looked something like this. In order to confirm that Malin was indeed a carrier of typhoid, Soper went to her and asked if he could test her bodily fluids for the presence of bacteria. Can you imagine how awkward that conversation was? <laughs> Apparently, he thought she'd just say sure and be completely cooperative. But her reaction was the opposite. He said she was indignant. She grabbed a carving fork and chased him out of the house. It's easy for us today to vilify Malin. But remember, we know today she was a carrier of typhoid, but she did not. To her knowledge, she had never had the disease. So can you imagine a stranger appears out of nowhere, accuses you of being responsible for spreading typhoid fever everywhere you've worked, even though you've never had typhoid and you're not actually sick with typhoid. In 1907, the concept of a healthy person carrying a disease was unknown to the public. Even scientists were only starting to realize it. And there's another element here too that could explain her anger. The late 1800s, remember this is a time when many Irish were emigrating to the US in droves, fleeing from oppression and starvation. They often came packed onto ships with other desperate immigrants. Many of them were starving and destitute by the time they arrived. Anti-Irish and anti-Catholic sentiment was strong. Many Americans condemned the Irish for being drunken criminals or associated them with filth and disease. For Malin, this could have felt like just one more way she was being persecuted for being Irish. Besides, think about this, even though Malin was a cook, at first it didn't make sense that she would spread typhoid so easily. The study of bacteria was still fairly young, but people knew that bacteria in food die when the food is cooked to a high enough temperature. So even a cook could be okay. Well, Soper went back and did some investigating and he soon discovered what Mary Mallon had served that got people sick. It was ice cream with fresh peaches, uncooked peaches. You put together uncooked peaches with Mary Mallon's unwashed hands, she admitted she didn't wash her hands, you've got the perfect recipe for bacteria to spread. Well, by the time Soper went back to find Mellon again at a new job in Manhattan, one servant was affected in that household with typhoid and the family's only daughter was dying. Soper didn't have any more luck this time. So he reached out to a New York City Health Department doctor named S. Josephine Baker. She was a woman, he thought Mary will be more cooperative with a woman, but Malin still refused. She actually ran away. She hid for about five hours in a storage area under a neighbor's stairs with ash cans piled up in front of it by other servants. But eventually Baker and the police that had come with her saw a little piece of fabric sticking out of the door. She was found forced into an ambulance and taken to the Willard Parker Hospital. Dr. Baker described the trip there as being a, quote, wild ride. Mellon was fighting and cursing the entire way. At one point, Baker said she had to sit on Mellon to help restrain her. Once Mellon was transferred to the care of the hospital, her body fluids were tested repeatedly, and most of them confirmed the presence of typhoid bacteria. Malin was held in isolation for two years in the care of the quarantine hospital on North Brother Island, which you see here, it's in the East River. During that time, she had 120 out of 163 stool samples test positive. Negative tests could happen when she was in remission. Within a few weeks of her capture, 
New York newspapers were covering the story. They were calling her a human typhoid germ, a danger to the community, a walking typhoid fever factory, all of which dehumanized this woman who had been arrested and incarcerated without any trial. Malin was determined to prove her innocence. This is Malin in the bed you see here in the foreground. She actually argued that she'd never been sick and she'd never been charged with a crime. Her livelihood was at stake. She had her own tests done, sent out her own bodily fluids to be tested. The chemist who did those tests were, was pretty respected. He said she no, showed no signs of disease. Again, remember, she could have been in remission. So no wonder Mary Mallon was mad. Her livelihood was at stake. She didn't have the disease. She never had the disease. And now a chemist has told her she's fine. Well, after a while, Mary Mallon, who we believe in this photograph is the fourth woman from the right, Mary Mallon finally sued for her release. She argued that um, since she had never committed a crime or had a trial, she couldn't be held. But the courts refused. They said they didn't want to bear any responsibility if anyone got sick or died from her. She remained in confinement another 11 months. It was during this period that the press officially christened her Typhoid Mary. This is an image from the New York American showing her as a cook. Instead of cracking eggs into a frying pan, she is cracking human skulls in there. Finally, Mary Mallon made a deal with the New York City Department of Health. They agreed to let her go if two conditions. Number one, she never again worked as a cook. And number two, she checked in with the health department every three months to verify where she was and what she was doing. Mary Mallon agreed. She was released. And with that, the story actually should have ended. But here's where things get a little dicey. Mary Mellon did go to work in other professions. She worked for a while in a laundry where she posed no danger, but the pay for laundry work was really low and it's backbreaking work. The temptation to return to cooking was really high. So she went back to work in a kitchen without telling the health department. She took jobs as a cook in a fancy hotel and then in a sanatorium and then in a restaurant. She used pseudonyms like Mrs. Brown or Marie Bressoff. And sure enough, about five years after Mary Mellon's release, an outbreak of typhoid hit the Sloan Hospital for Women in New York City. More than 20 people there, patients and staff, had come down with typhoid. A doctor there suspected it might be the cook. So he went to Dr. Soper with a sample of her handwriting and he asked, hey, you know, can you recognize this handwriting? Yep, you guessed it, it was Mary Mallon's handwriting. Now, by this point, Mary Mallon had gotten scared. She had left the hospital, but they tracked her down in her new job, broke into the house, and she surrendered, this time without a fight. She was sent back into quarantine on North Brother Island, which is where she would live for the rest of her life. She worked various jobs on the island, including working in the hospital laboratory. This is her on the right in her 60s. She was occasionally given permission to leave the island, to visit friends and, and to shop, but she always returned. The question that keeps coming up though is, did Manlin deserve to be vilified to such an extreme extent? Or was she a victim of typhoid in her own way too? Certainly it appears she never believed that she carried typhoid fever to the day she died. And it was definitely hard for most people, especially people who were not doctors or scientists, to believe that a healthy person could give somebody this deadly disease. We don't even know how many people she infected or how many she killed. The official count attributes to her 53 cases of typhoid and three deaths. But she was not the only known healthy carrier of typhoid bacteria. In fact, somewhere between 1 and 6% of people infected with the bacteria that causes typhoid become healthy carriers, asymptomatic carriers. Health officials knew there were others. One of them, in fact, was a Belgian-born immigrant who owned a bakery. He continued to work in his bakery even after being officially forbidden to do so. And when he was taken to court in 1924, 
he got a suspended sentence after he promised he would stay out of his bakery, stay out of the kitchen. The judge said, I can't legally jail this guy just because of his health. So again, why was Mary Mallon so vilified? Was it because she was a woman? Was it because she was Irish? Maybe it was because none of the others were considered quite as much of a danger as Malin. She did have a reputation for being almost pathologically angry and very irrational. Whatever the cause, Typhoid Mary alone was put into quarantine for the rest of her life. In 1932, she suffered a stroke, and in 1938, she died at the age of 70. Now, she might have been the first asymptomatic carrier to be publicly identified and studied, but at the time of her death, there were more than 400 healthy carriers of typhoid identified in the city of New York alone. No one else other than her was ever forcibly confined. And as far as typhoid fever goes, a combination of vaccines and improved sanitary measures saw cases of typhoid in the US drop dramatically in the early 20th century. Today, typhoid is pretty rare in industrialized countries, but it remains a significant threat in some low income countries. About 21 million cases of typhoid fever occur annually around the world. Typhoid fever might be largely gone in the United States, but a lot of the thorny issues that her case raised remain very relevant today. We are still debating, how do we protect the wider public's health without infringing on individuals' civil liberties? What do we do about super spreaders like Mary Mallon, people who spread many more cases than you would expect from someone carrying a particular bacteria? How do you balance public health and individual liberty? To some, Mary Mallon remains the most dangerous woman in America. To others, she's a real symbol of the undermining of individual liberties by the government. So there you have it. Mary Mallon was a real person and a person whose story might be a little more complicated than you ever thought. And it all started with a bowl of peach ice cream. Thanks for joining me. If you like this talk, take a minute and hit that subscribe button down there. Thanks so much. See you next time.